In business today, three things to know. First, is there panic in Europe over the economy? In a shocker, the European Central Bank, led by Mario Draghi, cut interest rates to near zero. They have never been this low before. Why now, and will it pull the continent out of the red? Then, fighting words from President Obama and UK Prime Minister David Cameron. The two say, quote, we will not be cowed as the NATO summit in Wales kicks off with a boatload of crises for the alliance to deal with. And build it in Nevada. Electric car maker Tesla chooses Nevada as the home of a new battery factory. Good old-fashioned competition between the states? Or did Elon Musk strong-arm his way to get what he wanted? Arise Exchange starts now. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Schmertz. Europe, it's now up to you. That's the basic message from the European Central Bank Thursday after it stunned the financial markets by cutting its ultra-low interest rate to the ultra-ultra-low level of 500th of a percent. That's historic and effectively means the ECB is out of tools when it comes to interest rates to jolt the sagging European economy. The euro immediately got crushed. It sank to a 14-month low against the dollar, dropping to $1.29. The chairman of the ECB, Mario Draghi, Compare. made the move days after Germany's economy slipped into the red. Draghi said the ECB is downgrading Europe even further. Compared with the June 2014 euro system staff macroeconomic projections, the projections for real GDP growth for 2014 and 15 have been revised downwards. And the projection for 2016 has been revised upwards. Draghi is basically the Janet Yellen of Europe. Global markets moved higher on the decision, but U.S. equities eventually gave up the early gains. Here's where the markets finished. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closing at 17,078 down, uh, just a fraction. The S&P 500 pulled back by three below to the level of 2,000, and the Nasdaq down 10 and changed to 4,562. Taking a look at commodities, gold closed down as well, 780 to 1,262, and gold back, and oil rather, back another dollar to 94.51. While Europe is stuck in the mud, the U.S. economy does appear to be on firmer ground, though some mixed economic news. The private sector created 204,000 new jobs in August, according to the payroll service ADP. That's slightly less than forecasted. And while weekly jobless claims rose by 4,000 last week, economists say the total number of claims still points to a tightening labor market. And productivity for U.S. workers improved in the second quarter. Numbers from the Labor Department show that the amount of output per hours worked rose by 2.3 percent, while wages dipped. And that's a key measure that the Fed looks at for inflation. There is a lot to talk about, though thankfully we have Dan Weiner, who is CEO of Advisor Investments, here to do so. So let's start with the ECB. Uh, sort of a shot across the bow of Europe today. What was the message that Mario was trying to send? We're in trouble. <laughs> The message is we've got to cut rates to 0.05 percent and try to stimulate this economy, get it moving again. You know, we've already seen negative GDP reports uh, across parts of the continent. We're very the, the European markets, the European consumer is very worried that, A, we may be seeing some deflation there, not inflation, and B, that the economies are going back into recession. We go back into recession. Unfortunately, the ECB has sort of used up all its firepower. You, you can't have negative that, That's right. Uh, There's rates. not much more to do. They did add a little bit of stimulus today, though, as well. You mentioned uh, going in reverse on GDP. We're starting to see Germany slip into the red here. And maybe that is what scared them because Germany is, of course, Europe's largest sure, economy. Sure. You know, what's, what's happening in Europe, it's very interesting. Uh, you and I were talking before the show. Interest rates. Uh, there was worry that economies were going to slip and, and default on their bonds. Italy had, had yields above 7 percent. Spain was in double digits. Right now, their bonds are trading almost at the same yields that we are in the U.S., 235, 240, 245. So the worry about these economies uh, defaulting mm -hmm. is gone, but the worry about them falling into a recession. Into, well, yeah, recession or, or, or worse. worse. Is, there, is there a little bit of a disconnect there, though, do you think? Well, I think there is, but I think that part of that is, is people, when people worry, they 
fly to bonds. You know, mm -hmm. there's a flight to quality, there's a flight to safety. So you have some flight to safety into U.S. bonds or into European bonds. But really, one of the reasons that our bonds are so low is there's been a huge flight to safety into our bonds. I mean, a 235, 240 yield on a 10-year Treasury today with our economy growing. You know, we, we had a 4.2% print on the GDP in the right. second quarter. Uh, everything that we've seen come out in the last couple of weeks, weeks suggests that manufacturing is on another uptick. Uh, the, the auto report you was mentioned spectacular. Was, was really good, you know, the best in, uh, I think, eight years. Um, the ISM report on manufacturing, the ISM report on the service economy, very, very strong. And if you look into those reports a little bit, uh, at least on the service economy, which is, you know, two-thirds or more the, of our U.S. economy, uh, we had... Uh, positive numbers there that we haven't seen for almost 10 years. What do you think we should be looking at tomorrow? We get the Labor Department report for August. That's the big jobs, number. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs, jobs, It's all about that. What the Fed's going to look at, I take it, the, the total number as well as possibly wage inflation. Yeah, I, the, the Fed obviously now is looking at jobs. They're not really worried about inflation because we haven't seen much inflation. You know, even the PCE, which is their favored uh, indicator, mm -hmm. You have to play with the numbers, you know, look at the last three months to find inflation above 2 percent. I mean, year over year, we're talking 1.6, 1.7 percent. And finally, right now, the U.S. equities doesn't seem to be too concerned that Europe is going to contaminate us. Not at all. They're not, just kind of like, no, I see mean, no evil. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, our economy is strong and our companies are doing well. Profits are up more than had been expected. Um, and that's a, a good thing okay, for Dan us Wiener. and for the market. Absolutely. Dan Weiner, CEO of Advisor Investments. Thank you. Sure thing. Leaders of NATO are gathering in Wales for what is being called the most important summit for the alliance since the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, and there is a whole lot on the agenda. Two of its leaders, President Barack Obama and British Prime Minister David Cameron, took to the Times of London today to warn against isolationism in the face of aggression in Ukraine and the terrorist militant group ISIS in the Middle East. In a joint op-ed story, they wrote, quote, we will not be cowed. And late this afternoon, NATO's president spoke about the situation in Ukraine. We strongly condemn Russia's repeated violations of international law. Russia must stop its aggressive actions against Ukraine, withdraw its thousands of troops from Ukraine and the border regions, and stop supporting the separatists in Ukraine. Our Washington Bureau Chief James Blue is in Wales with the latest. And James, hearing what you did today, is the world closer or further from war in Eastern Europe? I think we are a bit further from war in Eastern Europe. And what has happened here at the NATO summit, uh, basically the president of Ukraine has come here. He met with the leaders of NATO. He met with the sort of the big NATO guns. And basically he decided to take the potential ceasefire. So tomorrow in Minsk, Belarus, uh, there's going to be a meeting between the separatists and the Ukraine government, and they're going to try to sign a ceasefire. Basically what happened is there wasn't enough support uh, for NATO to um, join, to get Ukraine to join. There wasn't enough support to arm Ukraine. And there really is a sort of line in the sand. NATO does not want to go to Russia, or, uh, go, to, go to war with Russia over Ukraine. And when you um, mentioned... And so this is a moment where people are stepping back. People are stepping back. And when you mentioned the line in the sand, then where is the line in the border for Ukraine? Are they going to accept the giving up of some territory? Well, I think the ceasefire is the beginning of, com of negotiations and consultations on just what a peace plan might look like. But it seems, just from the outside where we are, that the Ukraine has decided they have to accept some of Russia's demands and that part of this, they can still kiss Crimea goodbye, they can probably kiss part of eastern Ukraine goodbye. But it was very clear that there wasn't the, sort of the... Uh, effort to want to challenge and confront Russia. Clearly, if Russia uh, doesn't follow the ceasefire, if Russia continues to support the separatists, maybe there will be some action. But it was a real sense uh, that Ukraine sort of has to take the hand that has been dealt and find peace. And uh, on a lighter note, how is Wales trying to 
capitalize on this summit. There was a story that they're closely watching what's going on in neighboring Scotland as to whether they secede. Right. So amid all of the sort of tension happening in, in uh, Eastern Europe, Wales is trying to capitalize on this moment where all the world's attention is focused on Newport and Cardiff. And they are basically sort of saying this is one of the best places in the UK. Uh, the people are more educated. They're more prosperous. Uh, the service industry is growing. They're, there's lots of jobs here. And they're trying to use this moment to attract businesses so that people will come back and invest in this sort of region of uh, Wales. A time to showcase the country. James Blue in Wales, thank you. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Coming up, fast food workers ditched the deep fryer for the picket signs and a demand for higher wages here on a rise exchange. Informative, the U.S. economy is on the right path and the wizard of the Fed is leading the way. We started our companies originally to create something that made a positive difference. Compelling. I became very successful. Not allowing myself to be average. Our favorite person of the day when we pick one person who grabbed our attention and not for the right reason. Yeah, he sort of lost All it. business. Investors came back from the long weekend tanned, rested, and ready to buy stocks. Entertaining Money Daily, a rise exchange. Welcome back to Arise Exchange. Fast food workers in more than 150 cities across the country protested today in the latest attempt to get employers to pay a minimum wage of $15 an hour and allow them to form unions. Aron Ivatori is a campaign strategist with the National Employment Law Project, which advocates for higher wages for fast food workers and joins us from Washington. Welcome to Arise Exchange. When you look at what happened today, do you get a sense that the business community momentum is maybe swinging in the workers' direction? I do think the momentum is swinging in the workers' direction. You see, every time the uh, fast food workers go on strike or mount protests, they're larger than the time before. This time it's 150 cities. This time we are seeing civil disobedience actions in cities around the country. There were a number of arrests today, for example. And do you, and do you support that, the civil disobedience? Well, I think the United States has a long and proud tradition of civil disobedience to try to bring about social change. and. This is very much in the vein of what took place in the 1960s during the civil rights movement. And really, the fight for 15 can be seen as the civil rights movement of the 21st century. Why do you come up with the number $15, by the way? Well, I think there are lots of different academics who've studied what it takes to earn a decent living in this country, to have enough money to make ends meet, to support your family, to pay rent. And uh, I think many people around the country, it's very intuitive. $15 is a figure. It's not going to give you a life of luxury, but it's going to give you enough to provide for your basic needs for yourself and your family. And it gives you something to put away in the event of a rainy day, in the event of a sudden emergency, the types of things that happen to people all, all the time. But, Aron, as you know, the, the other side of this is that there's an argument that by raising the wage to $15, you're ultimately going to cost jobs. Is there truth to that? I don't think so. I think economists have shown that uh, lifting wages to $15 is something that is sustainable in many places around the country. Um, and for, in the case of the fast food industry, these are corporations with uh, billions of dollars in profits. It's a $200 billion well, industry. Yeah, well, that, that's true, but, uh, but we're talking about a lot of franchises, though. There's a lot of mom and pop shops here. They are, but I think as the, uh, the general counsel of the Federal Labor Board has determined, you know, the, the parent companies have a responsibility here. They can't simply hide behind their franchisees and say, you know, it's not our problem. In a sense, you could say, you know, American business needs a, a buck stops here moment. Um, you know, are we going to take responsibility for the conditions of the people who help us earn a lot of money? And I think most Americans believe that companies that are as large as McDonald's or Burger King or Wendy's really should. But there's also been the argument that these always were supposed to be entry-level jobs and not career jobs. Now, that's a bigger economic argument. But maybe there's an argument that these companies should also be trying to uh, improve workers' employment conditions and have them move into new fields as well. Well, I think there always need to be people who serve burgers, who make fries, who are cashiers, who do home care work, who clean uh, buildings. And uh, maybe in the past, some of those jobs were more uh, entry-level jobs for teenagers. Nowadays, the average fast food worker, the average low-wage worker is an adult supporting a family. And if that's the case, we need to make sure these are jobs that pay people a decent wage. These are some of the 
fastest growing occupations um, in the United States. And if people are going to work in these jobs, there's dignity in work, but that dignity, that work should be rewarded fairly. Okay, so these strikes, you know, certainly grab a lot of media attention, but what's the next step here to actually get what your goals are? Well, um, I think the, the fact that we see civil disobedience going on today is a big step forward. You know, how did the civil rights movement achieve its goals? It sort of exposed the uh, injustices that were going on around the country, and there was a realization among the general public uh, that this is just not sustainable anymore. I think consumers are understanding that. I think the general public is understanding that. I think elected officials are as well. And ultimately, uh, these large corporations are going to realize that it's just not good for their reputations or for their business to, to stand in the workers' way. Aron Ivatori with the National Employment Law Project. Thank you so much. Thank you. Time now for our business ticker stories making headlines across the nation and the world. Former Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell has been found guilty on 11 counts of corruption. His wife, Maureen, also found guilty on eight counts. Federal jury found that the McDonald's abused the office of the governor in exchange for golf outings, vacations, and about $120,000 in loans. Hope it was worth it. Sentencing has been set for January 6th and may put the couple in jail for decades. Legendary comedian Joan Rivers has died at the age of 81. Rivers, who was known for her tart tongue and for being the first woman to host a late-night network talk show, died in New York after she suffered from complications from throat surgery. In other business news today, BP has been found grossly negligent for its role in the 2010 Gulf of Mexico oil spill. That from a federal judge today. The ruling means that BP could pay an additional $18 billion on top of the 42 billion that it has already paid. BP shares plummeted over 5% after the news. BP says it will appeal the ruling. A big change of heart for a former big city boss. After 12 years of mayor, as being mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg is returning to Bloomberg LP, the financial data company that he started 30 years ago. Bloomberg says he made the decision after seeing all the exciting new ventures that the company was up to. Current CEO Daniel Doktoroff will step down at the end of the year. Bloomberg owns more than 80 percent of Bloomberg LP. And how is this for an old school toy company coming out on top? For the first time ever, Lego sales have surpassed competitor Mattel, making it the largest toy company in the world. Profits from Lego's first six months of the year were up 11 percent, boosted by the Lego movie products. Nevada has won the electric car sweepstakes. Tesla has chosen Reno as the location for its new battery plant. It could employ as much and as many as six and a half thousand people. Nevada beat out Tesla's home state, California, Texas, and others that vied for the business. Here to tell us how the state of Nevada pulled it off is Alex Gutierrez. He is senior analyst with Kelly Blue Book. Welcome back to Rise Exchange, Alex. Hey, thanks for having me on. All right, so what did Nevada do here to get Tesla's business? Well, I think there were a few things that worked out in uh, Nevada's favor. I think, one, you have to look at their business climate. Um, I think overall, especially compared to California, it seems as though from a, a regulation, a legislation, a tax perspective, Nevada's got a little bit of a more of a friendly business climate for Tesla. I think that had to factor in. Uh, secondly, you just have to look at the location. On the one hand, it's only about 200 miles away from their uh, production assembly plant in Fremont. Uh, it's relatively close to uh, lithium deposits. And secondly, because Elon Musk is uh, such a champion for green energy, uh, the state of Nevada makes perfect sense in their desire to incorporate wind and or solar energy as a part of uh, the plant's construction. But it also makes perfect sense that he's going to a state unlike, Tesla, uh, unlike Texas, from what I understand, where you can sell the cars directly, right? He's in a big battle with the concept of auto dealerships. Absolutely. Yeah, Elon has been going uh, state to state to try and find a way to incorporate their direct uh, to consumer sales model. Um, there are state franchise laws in place which basically dictate that dealers have the first right to sell a vehicle from any major equipment manufacturer. Um, Texas happens to be one of those states where Tesla has not found success yet in terms of overcoming those challenges. Uh, so in that sense, it makes sense perhaps why Nevada was able to edge out Texas from that perspective. And, and Elon has been really vocal about this point. So the question is, was this fair competition between the states, or was Tesla here basically engaging in corporate blackmail? Do what we want done, or we're going to take our 6,000 jobs and maybe $5 billion, which is what this plant will cost elsewhere? Uh, I don't necessarily look at it as blackmail. I, th I think it's really just the cost of doing business. Which state presents the best opportunity, the best incentives for Tesla to... Um, to produce this plant, which is going to bring a, a lot of goodwill, a lot of money, a lot of jobs into the state that won the bid. And, and Nevada needs it, by the way. 
Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I know uh, Nevada, like like California, a lot of other states, uh, was relatively hard hit by uh, the recession. And granted, they're recovering, but I know uh, the unemployment rate in Reno is still north of 8 percent. So I, I think this couldn't come at a better time. Nevada's, of course, right next to California. Does this in any way ring the bell of California and say maybe we need to make some changes here? Yeah, I, I think there's um, th there has to be a realization that Tesla obviously chose Nevada over California for uh, for a host of reasons, and I think we know that there have been a number of in, a number of companies, especially in the auto industry. You look at Toyota, who just announced plans to move to Texas themselves. Um, there are a lot of companies that are looking elsewhere in the U.S. to do business, and I think California has to take a hard look at. Uh, the climates that they're putting out there and, and see if there are ways to make changes to make sure that they maintain these jobs, especially in, in the high-tech sector, which we know has been critically important for the state. You know, Tesla's talking about producing 100,000 cars by the end of the year. That still really pales in comparison, of course, to the U.S. other or U.S. automakers. Do you think they're going to get there, though? Yeah, I think there's a definite possibility that they can hit that number this year. Uh, we know that they want to continue to ramp up, uh, especially with the Gigafactory. They're going to have capacity for 500,000 batteries, uh, per year uh, once they get out to 2020, I think. So uh, I would say that it, it's definitely a possibility that they hit, this, hit that this year, and if not, uh, certainly in 2015. Okay, Alex Gutierrez with Kelly Blue Book. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Coming up, when a police force of seven managed to write 12,000 speeding tickets in a year, you know the police chief will be our favorite person of the day. That's next. I think that people in America do care about what happens throughout the world. Global warming is probably something that has to be addressed sooner rather than later. In Somalia, the genocide there, and that's something people don't know about. They have no idea the brevity of that situation. The first thing I think about when I think of Africa is like war and famine and disease. And right now with the tsunami that happened or the earthquakes in you know, Japan, we always look out for other people. Arise News, every culture, every angle. I think media and reporters have a lot to answer for. AIDS, hunger, um, people not having running water, the things that we just take for granted. I think the most important issues in the world today are education and poverty. Terrorism and war, I guess, is always. It's always an issue and, you know, the quality of life of certain, certain groups of people in certain areas. I think inequality. Arise News, every culture, every angle. Time now for our favorite person of the day when we pick one person who grabbed our attention and not for the right reasons. Today, it is the police chief of a small Florida city who oversaw the issuing of 12,000 speeding tickets in a town of just 1,000 people and just one traffic light. The police chief of the city of Waldo, Mike Zabo, is being accused of ordering his cops to write 12 tickets for each 12-hour shift. That's against the state law. They have a quota law. In total, Waldo's seven police officers managed to write tickets worth of $400,000 in fines last year. That's $57,000 in officer, twice their average yearly salary. So how did they do it? Well, the city is accused of creating six different speed zones in just two miles. The speed limit when you enter the city is 65. It then drops to 55, then 45, and then 35. Now, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement is investigating, and the city police department has been temporarily taken over by the county. Mike Zabo has been suspended and is our favorite person of the day. Coming up next, the competition isn't just on the field as two athletic clothing makers go at it for big-name endorsements. You're watching Rise Exchange. News can definitely be improved when reflecting diversity. A lot of mainstream news, they, they don't dive into it. Who wants to hear about negativity all the time? They only show what you what they think people want to know and not what people really should know. World-based stories, that's what I enjoy the most. I think uh, diversity of news is important to the world so that everybody will be aware of their surroundings and what is happening today. Arise News, every culture, every angle. Two days after Nike outbid Under Armour for basketball star Kevin Durant, Under Armour signed up supermodel Giselle to represent their brand. 
This works well for Under Armour since it's in the middle of the biggest campaign targeting women. Giselle is the latest addition to its $15 million women's campaign called I Will What I Want. Alan Adamson, managing director at Landor Associates, a branding and marketing firm, joins us to talk about this competition between Nike and Under Armour. I get the feeling that Nike sort of ignored Under Armour for a long time. They were in the back seat, and now they're right up there biting their heels. Yeah, what turned it around for Under Armour? I just think smart marketing and opportunistic, not going after perhaps the core Nike business, but coming up around the side targeting women. Yeah, sort of hitting them on the flanks a yeah, little bit. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, we, we hear these big endorsement deals. I mean, Kevin Durant is getting paid $300 million from Nike to do what? To wear the sneakers? To, to build their <laughs> image and to hopefully sell a lot more than sneakers. And does that help? I mean, do these endorsements really yeah, translate? I, I don't know the last time I ran around the park, but I'm not sure I'd run that much faster wearing Under Armour shorts or Nike shorts. So a lot is what it says about you and the image and the and sizzle. You wanna, and who you want to be connected yeah, with. Yeah, who, who you want to, what the brand is connected to. Because the performance, the differentiation in the products, really small. And the key here is because Under Armour like, bid about $240 million, Nike came in with $300 million. These are not in any way comparable size companies, however. Yeah. Even though Under Armour is getting its name next to Nike, Nike yeah. is a multi billion dollar conglomerate. Yeah, and it's a big bet uh, and it has to pay off over a long period of time. It's not what they do for you tomorrow. It's mm -hmm. what they might do a year or two years for you. And of course, with celebrity endorsements, you always run into trouble, especially with athletes that they do What happens when they're not winning when or, they're when, not they're, winning or, they're or when they're, they're being not good? That's right. Uh, meantime, Under Armour got Giselle. Talk to us a little bit about their sort of approach to going after women. I think it's a real smart choice for them. She's incredibly uh, talented, very hot. Her relationship with Tom uh, the Tom Brady, she's married yeah. to Tom Brady. And, and by the way, when Tom Brady is not the breadwinner in the family, you know. <laughs> he can retire pretty quickly that's now. That's right. She made $42 million last yeah, year. So, and said. that's just the beginning. Yeah. So I think it's a whole lifestyle. It's a, a long-term play. And I think the spot they've done with her, with her kickboxing, is fabulous. Okay. So now, if you're Nike, uh, how much are you sort of worried and looking behind you? You know, when you're in a race, you're not supposed to look behind you, right? But they're starting to look over but their shoulder. But you need to be aware of your competition. And the game is getting tougher. It's, they're not the only game in town. There's always been Adidas and others. But it's no longer about just picking the biggest star. It's putting a whole team together that's going to market your brand. And Under Armour has been successful in doing that, in going after athletes mostly? Or are they sort of branching out? I think there's a, it's broader with, uh, you know, but people that you want to be like, people that are aspirational, ideally authentic, uh, and they can do the marathon, do the long run, something that the brand can stick with for a long time. And these are long-term deals. Right. It's not what they can do tomorrow. It's what can they do over five years. So you're, making, you're buying a house. You're mm -hmm. not renting an apartment. And does Under Armour, they, do they both go after the same leagues? Because they, I mean, in the Kevin Durant's case, they went after basketball. But are they sort of playing in the same fields? Same fields. I want to be like them. So whoever they pick has to be aspirational, authentic, believable. Uh, and enduring. And as far as you know, how has this translated into sales for Under Armour as they've sort of come out of, I mean, two years ago, I don't think a lot of people have heard of them. No, I think they're, they're putting together. Now, the sales, is, it's never just the celebrity endorsement. You know, their business is driven by the product design, distribution, mm -hmm. many, many things. But to put the top spin on the business with the right celebrity spin is critical in their field. Is this good for both companies, do you think? Yeah, I think it's kind of competition. Yeah, uh, competition usually builds a category. Uh, usually it's not you win, I lose. Mm -hmm. it's, if both companies are doing well, they may appeal to different people, have slightly different stories. It's good for the segment. Um, and what more, what is the next step, do you think, from Under Armour? They sort of gotten their name out there. Do you think they're going to go directly more? You had said they kind of went around the flanks of Nike. Now do you see them targeting more I think it's going to be more head-on. It's going to get tighter and tighter and more competitive, maybe even into technology as, as the world of technology, not only what you wear, but how you measure your performance. Oh, that's interesting. Do you think that you're going to start seeing some, um, in the category itself, maybe some wearable like, yeah, uh, Nike technology? Nike sneakers tell, talk to your that's iPhone true. now. I'm sure Armorol is going to get in that business. So your shorts talk to your trainer. And, and does either company do particularly well in cities versus rural areas? I think they both do better in urban areas uh, just because of the population and uh, and uh, the business model. And I also wonder, because Nike is such a powerful brand, the Swish is one of the most, we have about 30 seconds left, one of the most recognized brands, but it is also controversial because they're so big and they've had issues with employment and kids and all of that, that Under Armour maybe has a little bit of a, a clean slate? Yeah, it's always somewhat easy to be a challenger, to be the winner, number one for a long period. It really is tough. You can win one year, but to win five years, to win ten years, years. gets harder and harder yeah, every year. Yeah, there's a lot of people looking you at you, right? You can't do what you did last year and say, let's keep on doing that. Okay, so maybe Under Armour is in a little bit better position.
position yeah. as being the underdog. Being number two we'll sometimes, sometimes not so bad. Helps. Alan Adamson, Managing Director at Lander Associates. Thanks for coming and talking Pleasure, to us about Andy. this. Thanks for having me. Tomorrow, the monthly jobs report for August is out. We will break down the numbers and see if the labor market continues to firm up. Let's take a look at the markets once again. All the markets pulling into the red after uh, being up a little bit earlier in the day because of what the ECB did, but they're probably looking closely at those unemployment numbers tomorrow. I'm Andrew Schwartz. Have a good evening.